Hey everyone out there, Dan here, aka the Common Concierge, and welcome to a brand new series I'm starting as I look through the career of Ed Breaker. I'm going to do an Ed Breaker career retrospective. What I hope to do for about the next 20 weeks, so I hope you'll stick with me with this adventure, is going through the career of Ed Breaker and talking about a number of the different comics that he has done, starting with the earliest I can get into the latest. I'll be going in Order for the most part, there'll be some adjustments to that here and there. I'll be talking about multiple comics. This episode, for example, I'll just be talking about one. But the hope is to kind of look at how much his career has progressed and, and, the, and talk about some some great comics. Uh, when people talk about and ask, like, who's your, your favorite comic book writer? I go to and say Ed Brubaker, but the truth is there's a lot about his career I have not read yet. A lot of really notable series, especially a lot of his earlier work. So I thought, well, let me change that. And you know, now that I have a comic YouTube channel, it does seem to make sense to include you all in this journey as well. I will say some of his early work is a little bit hard to get a hold of, especially if you don't have it right now. Low Life, for example, is right now out of print. Top Shelf did do a printing I guess right now, nearly a decade ago, and it used to be available digitally, but for whatever reason, it's not anymore. Maybe it will come back. Maybe there's kind of changing in the in in the ownership of it. Who knows? Uh, however, and, and there are other books like uh, I'll get into next week that are books I had to get from eBay because I couldn't find them anywhere. They're relatively cheap though. At, at the seams, I think I got for like six bucks on eBay, and then an accidental death, which is actually a combination of three different issues of Dark Horse Presents. Again, it was like $12. So despite the fact that they're relatively rare, and I think to me, an important part of, of comic book history, doesn't seem like speculators care all that much about them, which I'm all for, uh, but I was able to pick them up. So you may not be able to follow along with those. Hopefully they'll be available in some form or fashion sooner or later. Or if you are interested, like I said, I think I've, I still see a lot of copies available on eBay that you can get up relatively cheaply and cheaply. And I will spoiler and say uh, those were th two books that I really did like. So I, I do think it's worth the money for sure. I'll be talking, like I said, not about everything he did, but I'll try to cover really the majority of things, starting with his early career, getting into his DC work, his Marvel work, and then what he's kind of doing now with Image and his, and his Reckless series. If there are certain books you feel like I definitely have to cover, let me know in the comment section below. Uh, I, I think I have most of the, the main stories, at least the main stories I can get. Uh, but if there's something maybe that you definitely think should be included in that, uh, I'm all I'm all ears. But let's actually get into the book we'll be talking about this week, which is Low Life. And this is written and drawn by Ed Brubaker. A lot of people don't realize that Ed Brubaker, yes, when he first started out, was in fact an, an artist too. This came out in 1995 and it was published by both the Caliber Comics and Aeon Comics later in, in his publishing career. It was kind of going between both publishers. And it's really the, the first thing that, that broke Ed Brubaker out. It's not the first comic he ever wrote. I think that was maybe Gumby 3D, for example, but I was unable to find any copies of that. If you're able to find it, check it out. It might actually be kind of cool to see what was Ed Brubaker's first comic or, or first notable comic like. Uh, but this was really the thing that you can tell was the story he wanted to tell because it's semi-autobiographical about his life and just the trial and tribulations that he went through. And reading this and knowing that, the word that comes to mind is honest when it comes to this story. It is a feel a story that feels very honest. It almost feels like a confession in a way, going through all these bits of his life, talking about what happened. And the main character, Tommy, in this, which is clearly a representation of him, is not a good person. Like it's a, it's a person that you'll end up really not liking for a multitude of reasons. He does bad things. He's a, annoying. He can be abusive at times, both physically and emotionally. Uh, and it's not like it's trying to redeem the character in any way. It's, I think, showing a complete picture of him. Look at this. This is a combination of a, a number of short stories. There was about four issues that made up the entire, entire set. And each issue in itself sometimes had multiple stories as well. The first story is about him and this kind of failed crime adventure where he and, and another individual when at the time they were kind of low low key drug dealers and things were drying up a bit so in order to get money and really they just wanted money for drugs that they could take themselves they came up with his friend came up with this idea of robbing this computer store they thought it would be easy money have have the guy go in the back pull a gun on him take his money, get the computer, and you're good to go. Uh, however, what they're seeing is that, you know, a life of crime is is not a hard one to turn down if one time you're successful and what happens next. And then you see the volatility of his friend as well and what he's willing to do. You see him kind of going off the deep end. 
And it's kind of a, an example of how you know, the old Brad Franklin saying of when you sleep with dogs, you, you rise with fleas. And you saw Tommy really put him in, in, in situations where he was, you know, with a lot of people that were not the greatest people in the world. And to be fair, either was he. And this was a story, this was a combination of stories where story plot wasn't the, the main thing, wasn't the most important piece of this. This was all about character and really kind of slices of life stories. Looking at this, I saw a lot of people compare this to like Richard Linklater movies, which to me makes a, a lot of sense. You know, Slacker is something that I kept thinking about reading this, you know, the Before series. For those that don't know, the, the Before series is done by Richard Linklater and it's the Before Midnight, Before Sunrise, Before Sunset. Uh, and they're really stories that all take place in the day and are just people having conversations. I know a lot of people will think that, that are awful. I do really love those movies but again with which little link later maybe something more like days and confused for example where you're just kind of hanging out people that are maybe not always the greatest people in the world maybe they are but they're always interesting and they're always intriguing and there's always that element of honesty throughout now, now looking at the cartooning here again this is ed brubaker doing everything on the page and reading this it's like seeing just how much indie comics has changed throughout the years when you think indie comics today image and things like that you realize the the fighting factor between which image what's indie and what's big two is not as as big as it used to be they all have kind of the same access to things like it doesn't cost nearly as much when it comes to making comics in the sense of like the tools you can use due to things being digital and things like that this was a complete indie book all all done in that fashion it makes you realize how much things has changed like from the hand lettering to the, the black and white look you know this was a true indie book uh kind of the style you don't get anymore this is very much in the vein of, of a 90s comic. although not that like the fashion is, is super 90s although the hairstyles do appear that way in a way and I think when I think of 90s, I think it what it really gets to in the 90s is that Gen X kind of lack of direction. You, you see these characters and that is the continuous thread throughout. There's just this con confused lack of direction. They just really don't know where to go in life. They're just kind of getting by, just kind of hanging out. And that's why I think it works because narratively, yes, it is just the story about hanging out. But I think it speaks to the specific time and place. You know, we have a, a lot of that in, in the zeitgeist for movies like Clerks, for example, people just at a store talking. It also makes me think like, why was it so entrenched into the 90s in that way? Why was that kind of lack of mentality, uh, whatever you want to call it, such a big piece of the culture at the time? Was it simply because there's this lack of progressive movement? I mean, when you think about the 60s, you had all the different protests, the free love of the 70s, whatever you want to compare it to, the, the access of the 80s, and maybe it was a reaction to that you know 80s were big and bold breed is good all that type of stuff where the 90s really brought things down to the basics in, in a way and again i'm speaking as someone who was a, a kid for most of the 90s so perhaps this is just the perception of what it was and it was you know, much more varied than that that's certainly the case but i do think this book specifically is, is speaking to that generation in, in that way and you know you get other stories well really the, the, the center of this similar again comparing it to the before series which is about a relationship that's the case here with, with tommy and sonny and they're this is a strange relationship where they, their their stories go throughout. And if I had one one issue with this book is that it does shift in timelines a lot. Like it's hard to really get your bearings of one comes first, what comes second, and Sunny's in the picture, she goes away. I don't know if that's because you have a book that again was switching publishers. This wasn't something that was maybe designed to like be a complete series at that time. You know, trade paperbacks weren't really something that people did to a great extent. I think they were just meant to be. Here's one issue. It's it's complete. And when you put it all together, it, it's a bit, a bit messy to read when you're trying to just figure out where everything is within the timeline. It doesn't necessarily impact your comprehension of everything all that much, but you feel like one storyline is over, then it picks up later. It's a minor issue, but generally, again, it's about Tommy and Sonny. You see that relationship pop in and out a great deal. And the relationship is what you would classify as an unhealthy relationship. Uh, there's even times where, you know, that again, we talked about it getting abusive. Uh, there's uh, later, one of the last stories is about Tommy has this friend who basically, for whatever reason, is all women are attracted to him and he has this saying about we're all people and he'll like openly make out with someone uh, even if their boyfriend's like right there he's just like yeah we're all people that's how we all are and you just see the jealousy there but i think what's really interesting too is that i think he, he's trying to comprehend like what exactly are relationships are we in fact all people we don't really own individuals are we making a big deal out of everything and i think that's a thing with this is that 
this isn't a book with answers. It's a book with questions and a book with just trying to figure things out similar to the characters are. And that's, I think, was something I, I felt rather comprehensive and rather compelling as well. And and we look at the art here too, again, that, that's another part of this. And I was interested to see like, you know, Edward Baker clearly you know, doesn't really do art anymore. Was it because he wasn't very good at it? And I don't think that's the case. I think similar to his writing style, his, his art is very character focused. Most of the attention is on the characters, their design. They kind of have the, that over oversized head in a way so you can get a lot of expression on the page. Good body language. I do think though it's very clear when it comes to storytelling, he was much more comfortable as a writer than he was as an artist. A lot of the words are doing the heavy lifting. There are times where he lets the art tell the story, but more often than not, the words are the ones that are kind of putting everything in perspective. Rarely does he just let the, the words, the art of the page kind of tell you what you need. And he, he does, I think, have the fundamentals of what makes a good artist. I don't think he'd ever be an all-star artist. Anyone that would ever cross over to like a Marvel or DC, if he went that route, he doesn't have that type of style or, or that ability to really adjust. The other issue too is that Sometimes it felt like I, I, the character designs didn't differentiate themselves all that well. At, at times I thought someone was a character from a previous story, but it was entirely someone different. Maybe that was just because everyone had a similar look to them, because especially when it came to facial hair. I don't know, but and generally I thought the art was solid. It was good. It, it was effective at what it needed to do. But really what was the star here was the story itself in, in the way that Edward Baker told it. And looking at his career, knowing what I've read so far, what I see right away is how well he uses first person perspective. And again, I think breaking down those walls and it makes sense when this is a story that he's telling because it is actually real life to, to choose that method. I think that would make you the most comfortable if you're telling a story that is relating to what you've done in the past, you know, the actual you know, adjusting things, trying to tell it in third person, it would be a bit, bit weird. So tell it as it is, change the names, but with that, I think that's why we got that honesty in a way. And he's very effective in that. It's just the naturalistic aspect of the dialogue. Everything feels real. Like he feels like he's talking to you. He feels like he's talking to himself. And it, that's why even though there's a lot of words on the page at times, it's always compelling. That's something right from the beginning he was really strong at was, was his ability to build dialogue and have characters that were you know, unique and interesting and, and flawed, extremely, extremely flawed. And as I mentioned, the stories do vary throughout. You know, you have one story when it's him, like, and working at this video store and this weird relationship he has with the owner there. And, like, he's kind of stealing money, but people are worse than he is. And you, you see him, like, being kind of conflicted in a way. And that's really the thing that you see throughout is, is that this conflict throughout, like, like trying to figure, figure himself out. And again, I think that is probably something he was working through uh, as he's writing this as much as he, as he was when the events happened. That's, again, just something that is me just putting something there that may not be there, but it seems pretty obvious to me. So if you are a Brew Breaker fan, ultimately, when I look at today, I enjoyed this book that I not enjoy this book. I really did like this book a great deal. It's a really impressive debut, or if you want to call it debut. And it, it, to me, now when I'm reading debut comics or any comics, I'm going to think about like this book and how well and how much of Ed Brubaker was there at the beginning. It's not the best thing he did. It's a little rough around the edges at times. Like I mentioned, it's a bit messy. It's not as complete. I think he did struggle with endings here and there. And I think sometimes people tend to, especially earlier in their career, when it comes to endings, be a bit ambiguous or have endings that just kind of happen because that's the way life is, which I get, but it's not always the most narratively satisfying. It doesn't happen all the time. One of my favorite endings was actually really a story of this, them going to the nightclub and how Tommy was just this awful human being, just kind of got drunk and was awful. And then he went with his friend and how that ends. And it, it, it was a funny kind of a coda to that. And there was a good amount of humor here too dark and twisted humor but, but but funny humor and if you have the ability to check this out if you do have if you see it on your your shelf or at your local comic book store or at, at our bookstore you can get it for cheap online it was hard to find online i think the actual like ebay price for the graphic novel was like 80 dollars, which i wouldn't spend that much like i said there probably would be another printing at some time when you have a, a someone like ed brubaker it would make a lot of sense. I could see this becoming some sort of TV show or something like that. I don't. I doubt it at this time since it's been, you know, almost thirty years since this debuted, which made me feel old saying that out loud. But uh, it was it was great. If, if you like those movies, like I talked about, Richard Linklater's movies, uh, Clerks, in a way, it's not as I would say as sardonic as Clerks or as brash with its humor, but just it, it very much speaks to that time the same way that. 
clerks spoke to that time. But anyways, I'm getting a bit repetitive now when it comes to my breakdown of this. But it does have me excited now because, you know, it was great to go back and see how much of Ed Brubaker was there from the beginning. It makes me wonder, like, where does he go next? You know, when I think Ed Brubaker, I tend to think crime. And this wasn't a crime story. This was a human drama story. This was a relationship story, which now makes me realize when it comes to Kill or Be Killed, which is a crime story, but has really successful kind of relationship drama within it as well. It all makes more sense now because I'm like, oh, that's kind of where he started. Like, that's really where it was his strength to start off with. And then he evolved into the crime bit. I, I saw people kind of link this as a crime book. I would not call it a crime book whatsoever. Uh, yes, you have that opening story that deals with a crime gone wrong. But that's really the only one, really. Like, everything else outside of that is just general human drama, relationship drama, dealing with roommates, dealing with a job you hate was all that type of stuff. So going in with those expectations, you'd be going in thinking you're getting, you know, criminal in the early years, that's not the case. All right, well, that's it for, for, for me for this week. I'll start babbling. Next week, I'm actually going to be talking about, uh, first off, the accidental death, which was taking place in three issues of Dark Horse Presents. Uh, and he, he did not write and draw that. He just wrote that one with a different artist. And then the second book I'll be talking about in next week is At the Seams, as I mentioned earlier. And that is a one shot that he did. He, he wrote and draw it. And it was very similar to Low Life, which, which is a combination of short stories. So we'll talk about those next week. And then eventually we'll be getting into some of the more notable books. But I figure, you know, let's get into the earlier stuff first and see, see how things kind of started off, set that foundation. And then we'll get into, you know, the Batmans and the Captain Americas eventually. Uh, thanks for taking the time to ch check out this channel. Let me know what you think of Ed Breaker. As I mentioned, what are some books I should check out? Have you read this? Are you interested in it? Let me know. I know there are a ton of comic book channels out there, so I appreciate any comment, anything like that. I, I, I thank you for taking the time to do that. It really means a lot. Just remember that comics are for everyone. The key is finding the right one. Until next time, keep reading.